What's up y'all? Professor Hurley here with another cool anatomy video on purple bear biology. If this is your first time visiting, make sure you click the subscribe button to follow my other videos on topics like anatomy and physiology, microbiology, and some general principles of biology. In this video, we are going to move into muscle types and functions, as well as muscle structure, down to the individual muscle cell fibers. It is a pretty cool topic and really important to grasp for us to move on to our next conversation, which is neuromuscular junction and contraction. Okay, so to get started, you have three different types of muscle tissue divided into two groups. Voluntary muscle that you can directly control called skeletal muscle, which enables you to move around, and involuntary muscle that you do not have direct control over that can either be smooth muscle or cardiac muscle. Smooth muscle is used throughout all of our organs and vessels to regulate internal movements like digestion and blood flow. Cardiac muscle is, well, cardiac muscle. It's what's used to form our heart. Skeletal and cardiac muscle have some pretty cool, unique features associated with their function. So let's take a closer look at them. Skeletal muscle comes in all shapes and sizes but individual cells that make up this tissue can be quite long. Because of the length of an individual fiber, muscle cells must overcome the challenge of generating enough protein along the entire length of the cell. To do this, they are multinucleated, meaning they have multiple nuclei that span the entire cell. Additionally, muscle cells are striated, meaning they appear to have stripes or bands throughout them. The visible striations are actually associated with protein strands that pull together whenever a muscle cell contracts. We will discuss these later in the video. These same striations can be seen in cardiac muscle. In addition to being striated, cardiac muscle also has a feature called intercalated discs that enable electrical signals in the form of ions to pass between cells. This enables our cardiac muscle to synchronize cellular contraction to give us controlled heartbeats. Despite these unique features, these three muscle types contain cells that have similar characteristics and work together to perform the muscular system functions. Let's first talk about the characteristics of muscle cells. All the muscle cells in our body contain these primary properties, contractibility, extensibility, elasticity, and excitability. First, they are all able to contract, which basically means shorten. In the case of our skeletal muscle, this produces movement. For smooth muscle, that may move food through our digestive system or reduce blood flow to capillaries. And for cardiac muscle, it is what allows it to squeeze to pump blood throughout our body. Muscle cells must also be able to stretch without tearing, which is referred to as extensibility. Imagine that your bicep could contract, but when you extended out your arm, your cells would not elongate. You would be stuck in a permanently flexed position. That would definitely not be good for movement. In addition to being able to elongate, they must be able to return back to their original shape. This is referred to as elasticity. The last and probably most important property is the cell's ability to get excited. This means that they have a resting state and an excited state. For our muscles, the resting state is when muscles are relaxed. And the excited state is when our nervous system signals to the muscle to shorten and contract. All of these features enable muscle tissue to perform five major functions. The movement and stability functions of muscle are pretty straightforward. But let's look at the last three. Glycemic control is regulation of our blood glucose levels. Muscle helps regulate this by serving as a site to burn off excess glucose in the blood. Muscle cell contraction requires an immense amount of ATP, so mitochondria in the muscle cells work overtime, and muscle cells can be stimulated to burn energy when it's in excess. Additionally, if our body temperature begins to drop, muscle cells can be stimulated to burn energy and generate heat in the form of shivering. The last primary function is regulation of movement throughout the body. We have sphincter muscles that wrap around the passageways that can either be open or close to regulate flow. We have these muscles on vessels leading to capillaries in our circulatory system and leading from one digestive location to another in our digestive system. Sphincter muscles on our capillaries can regulate our body temperature by determining how much blood goes to the surface of our skin and extremities, as well as regulating blood pressure by regulating blood flow into the capillaries. Before we move on, one thing I would like to mention is how muscles produce movement. First, our bones are linked together with joints. These joints allow movement in a particular direction as muscles contract. Muscles attach on one side of the joint and then stretch for attachment on the other side of the joint. To produce movement, the fibers inside of the muscle cells pull together 
shortening the muscle overall. Note that the shortening process is a pulling force and is what gives us movement. Muscle cells never push to produce movement. This means that if I flex my arm, I must have muscles on the opposite side to pull it back to an extended position. Muscle groups are formed in this way, where agonists produce movement and antagonistic muscle groups produce the opposite movement to return to the original position. Okay, so that's all pretty cool. But now let's take a closer look at the cellular structure of muscle. We will focus our attention on the structure of skeletal muscle. Let's jump into the Complete Anatomy app and take a look at the structure of muscle. Here we have an example of the major muscles of our body. Notice that if we zoom in, the muscles can actually be divided up into smaller structures. Each of these bundles is referred to as a fascicle. But if we go closer, you can see that each of these fascicles is actually a bundle of fibers as well. These are called muscle cells. As a side note, muscle cells go by many different names, including myocytes, and they're commonly called muscle fibers because they're so long. So collectively, we can see that muscle is a bundle of fascicles that is actually a bundle of muscle cells all working together. This is a nice holistic view, but it still does not get us close enough to discuss contraction and where that takes place. So let's delve even deeper. Here's a cross section of an individual muscle fiber from one of those fascicle bundles we saw earlier. Around the outside, we can see the sarcolemma or the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. This is a motor neuron responsible for stimulating muscle contraction. So if all of this is one cell, you may be wondering, what are all these individual fibers found inside? Each of these is referred to as a myofibril. On the outside of these myofibrils, we can find multiple nuclei throughout the cell and numerous mitochondria dispersed throughout as well. Wrapped around each of these myofibrils, we can find a structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum stores and releases calcium to regulate protein filament interaction. In addition to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we have a structure called the T-tubule. Electrical stimulation from the periphery of the cell travels through the T-tubules to the deepest part of the muscle cell so that all of the myofibrils can be engaged for contraction. If I rotate up, and zoom in a little bit, you can see that each of these myofibrils is actually made up of additional elongated filaments. These are called myofilaments. And we've reached the end of what this anatomy app can show us, so now we need to jump back into the slides to take an even closer look so that we can begin to understand the individual unit of contraction called a sarcomere. This is a lot of fibers within a fibers within a fibers, and it can be hard to understand where we're actually at. So let's step back out and take a look at some slides and look at a big picture of this. Here we see a segment of muscle off the bone that can be broken down into bundles called fascicles. Each of these fascicles are groups of muscle cells. An individual muscle cell is made up of a bundle of myofibrils wrapped in a sarcoplasmic reticulum. Inside of myofibrils, we find the last two fibers of this rabbit hole. These are called myofilaments. There are two types of myofilaments, thick filaments called myosin, and thin filaments called actin. These are two long filament proteins that interact to produce skeletal muscle contraction. Notice that myosin filaments have structures called heads. These heads attach to the actin filament in an area called the active site, and then pull the filaments closer together during contraction. This contraction is regulated by the availability of the active site on the actin filament. Two regulatory proteins control active site availability. Tropomyosin is a protein that can move in front of the active site to shut it off, and troponin is the protein that moves tropomyosin in and out of the active site location. If you can imagine this like a drawbridge on a castle, the bridge is tropomyosin, and the wheel to open or close the bridge would be troponin. A set of actin and myosin filaments is referred to as a sarcomere and is the unit of contraction for muscle. When activated, myosin heads pull actin filaments together and shorten the muscle, leading to contraction. When deactivated, the fibers stretch back out to elongated positions. All of these fibers are what make your muscle look striated. So you may be wondering how this works. Let's run through the general process. The connection between actin and myosin is referred to as a crossbridge. 
Here's how the crossbridge forms. Calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum attaches to troponin, which moves tropomyosin from the active site, making it available for myosin heads to attach. A covalent bond in ATP is broken, and the energy is used to change the shape of the myosin head so that it can be attached to the active site. Breaking the bond in ATP results in converting it to ADP and a free phosphate. Once a crossbridge forms between actin and myosin, ADP is released and the myosin head returns to the original unaltered shape. As it returns, it pulls the actin filament with it. ATP is then again used for energy to break the crossbridge and that myosin head can be recocked to fire again. The entire process of sarcomere shortening in this way is called the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. Now there are two important things to note about this process. First, the process requires ATP to move the myosin head and to break the cross bridge. This means that without ATP, we cannot contract muscle or relax them. The second important thing is that contraction can only occur if calcium is present to move regulatory proteins. Our next conversation is going to talk about where that calcium comes from and how our bodies regulate the availability to control muscle contraction and ultimately give us muscle movement. Well, that's it for this episode of Purple Bear Biology. If you liked the video, click the like button and subscribe so that you can follow along in our next video about the neuromuscular junction. I appreciate y'all spending some time with me and I'll see y'all next time.